hello. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I am Helen Thomas. I am the chair of the Outreach Committee for SGA for 2022. And we, in collaboration with the Education Committee today, are delighted to present a glimpse into some of our Middle Georgia repositories. Um, we have with us today, just to kind of situate where everyone is in your minds, uh, Alex Hughes, Government Records Archivist and Assistant Director for the Troop County Historical Society Archives and Legacy Museum. We have David Owens, Head of Archives and Special Collections for Columbus State University. Uh, Daniel Williams, University Archivist and Head of Archives, Special Collections and Digital Initiatives for Mercer University. And Renee Chirac, cur Curator of Historical Collections and Archives, uh, representing the Heritage Unit of Augusta University Libraries. Um, a few housekeeping things before we get started. We are recording this meeting to make it available to anyone who couldn't make it today. Uh, I'm gonna ask everyone in the interest of time to hold questions. Uh, for the end, we will have a Q&A session for all of our presenters. And just a reminder, if you're not speaking, mute your microphone. If you are speaking, turn your microphone on. We've learned that one already. Um, and with that, I am going to turn things over to our first presenter, Alex Hughes from the Troop County Historical Society Archives and Legacy Museum. All right, thank you. All right, good afternoon. My name is uh, Alex Hughes. I'm the Government Records Archivist and Assistant Director of the Troop County Archives and Legacy Museum on Maine in LaGrange, Georgia. I want to start by thanking Helen Thomas, the Society of Georgia Archivists Education and Outreach Committees, uh, the Board of Directors, and others who plan today's events. To begin my presentation about our institution, I think it is important to begin with how our organization began and how it is structured today by way of its progress throughout the years. In 1976, the Oak Fusky His, uh, Historical Society was founded. The intention of the Historical Society was, of course, to preserve the town's history, but also to pursue, pursue the possibility of bringing a replica statue of the Marquis de Lafayette uh, to the center of town, which you can see being hoisted there. In, in 1981, uh, the name of the Historical Society was changed to the Troop County Historical Society. And by 1983, the Society opened the Troop County Archives in order to preserve the original documents of the county. The archives con uh, contracted with the county and city governments to maintain their archival records, and but also to assist them with records management responsibilities. Eventually, the school system was added as a contract uh, with the archives as well. Of course, the government records uh, in, in the 70s and 80s were stored in a condition that we're all familiar with. Uh, the records were relegated to the basement of the courthouse and forgotten. So those had to be taken out. And uh, the, his, uh, the Historical Society dreamed of the day that a local uh, history museum could be opened at its location on Main Street. In the early 2000s, Legacy Museum on Main opened to the public with much excitement in town. So to give you a quick overview of the structure of the organizations, I'll show you through the use of an umbrella. Uh, the Troop County Historical Society is a parent organization of three other organizations that have their own functions. We have, of course, the museum as the public outreach arm, the historical archives and research library, and the government records center as well. And I will say of this, uh, and I want to be careful how I say this, but as of Monday, we will, um, a, the Hogansville City Council will be voting as to whether or not they want to contract with us as well. So we're expanding those um, government contracts for records management and archival holdings as well. All right. And as of 2017, the museum has aimed to provide more creative and robust programming to reach out uh, to the community and highlight the rich holdings of the historical archives. Pictured here, you'll see uh, actress Carol Kane portraying Mahaley Lancaster as a part of our Halloween walking tours that we call Mystery in Our History. Each stop on the tour highlights well-documented uh, research on an individual or group in LaGrange and Troop County's history. We have also recently begun uh, to offer a High Noon History Series, which you'll see there on the very right, um, that provides lunch lectures at the Lafayette Square in LaGrange. And we have been uh, 
blessed with really fortunate weather for both of the events that we've had so far, which, I, you know, outside events are always, you're always kind of worrying about the, the weather, but we've, we've gotten good ones there. So even Azalea's in the picture. Um, so to go back uh, to the organizational history of the archives, uh, eventually as time went on, the records holdings became larger as a lack of, and a lack of wise management and resources created significant issues. Uh, records were housed in three different facilities throughout the downtown area, but one facility in particular that you see pictured here had the HVAC um, system cut off by the previous Archival, Archival Administration, uh, not to mention the lack of the organization within the facility. In 2019, the current administration of the archives lobbied the three governmental entities that we contract with and was able to secure funding to renovate the facility. We now have a fully functioning facility with proper environmental controls and security measures. Um, and then you'll see some empty shelves there. They're not empty anymore. Um, and then in, in 2019, I'm oh, sorry, let me see that. Some of our other projects include a new website that will launch in August of this year, which will hopefully provide for easier uh, user experience for our patrons. And of course, our patrons include researchers, academic scholars, uh, genealogists, local citizens, and many more. Last year, uh, in parallel with our website overhaul, we began a migration of over 30,000 digital images from uh, our long held past perfect databases uh, to content DM. We're excited about the increased accessibility that this will provide, but also are working um, with each one of those 30, we're touching each of the 30,000 images to work on the metadata and to improve that. All right. And we also recently received uh, grant funding from the Georgia Historical Records Advisory Council to preserve, process, rehouse, and digitize uh, Troop County marriage records from 1836 until the year 2000. Um, and the digitized surrogate records from this project will be uploaded to Content DM for greater access. Although we won't be uploading all of them at once due to privacy issues, but they will be there. And then a few other fun documents that we have. Um, always like, you know, kind of thrown in some bonuses. It's 1828 uh, slander and trespass case. And the funding, Union Street School records. And then, of course, uh, this is my contact information. If anybody would like to get a hold of me, I'd love to talk, chat, and uh, be happy to take any questions at the end of this presentation. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Alex. Next up, we have David Owens, Head of Spe Archives and Special Collections for Columbus State University. All right. Thank you all for having me. Give me just a second to share my screen. Okay, does that get y'all the full presentation view? Yes, you're all set. Excellent, thank you. Okay, well, as Helen said, I'm David Owings. I'm the head of Archives and Special Collections, and I'm happy to talk to you a little bit more about uh, some of our collections and some of our uh, recent news about our projects and initiatives. Uh, so we'll go ahead and dive right into it. Uh, so a little bit about the CSU Archives and Special Collections, and many of you are familiar with these types of records and documents, so we won't go through these line by line for the, the sake of time, but just the highlight that we are a repository for both the university records, as well as uh, our mission is to collect on the city of Columbus and the surrounding Chattahoochee Valley area. Uh, basically, I define those as the counties around Muskogee County. Uh, so the next couple of slides, um, I have some examples of items from our collection just to illustrate little stories that we find and uh, some of my personal favorites I'd like to share. Uh, so we do have lots and lots of newspapers and Columbus has had uh, many variations of newspaper companies over the years. And, uh, so we, we, we have lots of them going all the way back uh, to the 1830s. Uh, and yes, we do have microfilm, which, which our researchers hate to use. Uh, we have uh, many of the original print copies, which are much more fun to use, but we realize those are deteriorating. They're very fragile. They, wasn't, they were never intended to last. 
but on that note, uh, we were, did just go out and buy a full subscription to NewsBank. Uh, so you can come on site to our archives and uh, we, we can get you set up on NewsBank. And uh, what's great about that is you can search by keyword, you can filter by dates. Uh, and I, I tell people as much as you know, we as archivists know the, the power uh, uh, and, and impact of microfilm, uh, it's not fun trying to, to reel through that one article we're looking for. <laughs> So we do have lots and lots of photographs. Uh, you know, this is a very small selection of photographs, just a few of, of my favorites I like to highlight. Uh, so starting on the bottom left, that's the Springer Opera House here in Columbus that was built in 1871. And this image we think is from about 1895. And what I like that about this picture is that it shows an interesting part in our city's history. You've got uh, you have a lot of foot traffic, you've got the new electric trolley cars, and then you've still got the old horse and buggies going up and down the street. Uh, and speaking of horse and buggies, the, the, the next image there I'd like to highlight is a, an image of the coach line that used to run from Columbus to Warm Springs, Georgia. Uh, that's where people took their vacations. Uh, and I'll never forget uh, one day I was playing in the newspapers and uh, some of y'all might know uh, back in this time period when people were vacationing, they would make that announcement in the newspaper so people would know where they were at. And one of my favorites, this local family put in the newspaper that they would be rusticating uh, out in Warm Springs on, <laughs> on their retreat. <laughs> the next image, we do have lots of, uh, of uh, family photographs and to go with our family papers. And then this particular image is of the Rhodes family. Uh, who were a very influential family in Columbus, Georgia. They uh, actually moved to Columbus from Massachusetts to, to bring their Massachusetts knowledge of textile mills down here to our Columbus textile mills, and they, they ended up staying. And the last image there is an image of 12th Street and Broadway, and another one of my personal favorites, just because of all the activity you see going on. And uh, I, I like to tell people that's an early Columbus traffic jam. Uh, so moving ahead, of course, uh, as an archive, we have, you know, our, our real bread and butter is documents. And uh, amongst those documents are all the great stories that letters and uh, correspondence tell. Uh, and just two of my, uh, again, my favorites as we go through this presentation is uh, on the left is a uh, one image from a World War II uh, correspondence from Columbus native. Um, let me see, I've got his full name here. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Amzi Rudolph Quillian. Uh, this particular letter is, is on Valentine's Day, February 14th, 1943, uh, and he's talking about how he and his friends are learning to play chess and some of the other things they're doing during their downtime, and uh, including his friend Butch, who is quite lousy at playing blackjack. Uh, but on a more serious note, I don't have a, a scanned image of this, but one of his other images, one of his other letters, uh, of course, we have boxes of his correspondence during World War II, and uh, ultimately, he did not make it back home. He, he was killed in combat. Uh, and he writes this, you know, really powerful letter back home. I, I've got a quote for you to his uh, wife and his then as of yet unborn daughter. And it goes, the reason for this letter is that because of the business I'm engaged in, it is possible that I may never get to see you. If I, if I do get to see you, this letter is pointless and should be destroyed. But if I shouldn't, I want you to know how I feel about the reason for it. We are living in a time now when soldiers must be willing to die for their country or else we won't have a country. I won't go into detail because you will read it all in your history books. Of course, I am willing to die if necessary, but before I go, I expect to make many Germans die for their country. Uh, and of course, as I just said, he ultimately did not make it back home. Uh, so the really emotional letter that uh, I like to share with our visitors and especially our students to convey the real intimate and personal stories that you will learn in archives. Uh, and a nice parallel to that going further back in time, the, the image on the right is from the, uh, the Civil War and then this is the mother writing her last son. She had three sons uh, and she's writing her last son to tell her that her other two sons have just been killed in combat. And so another really emotional letter uh, and one thing that I don't know if we can ever prove, but I, I, I like to speculate that the smears you see there on that letter might be, in fact, tear stains. 
Uh, so moving on along, and, and y'all please let me know if I'm, I'm going over my time, uh, feel free to chime in. Uh, but I do have a couple of images of maps for you. Uh, uh, maps is another one of my favorite things in our collection. Uh, as a local repository, of course, we have many, many local Columbus maps. Uh, but we're also very fortunate to have this uh, a larger map collection, which was given to us by Mr. Spencer. Uh, and you can see there are some of the categories I've broken it down into. It includes maps of early explorers and colonies going all the way back to 1590. Uh, we've got some larger maps of North America, the maps of the Southeast in general, and then maps of Georgia ranging from 1729 to 1864. And moving along, I've got two images to share with you. This is that our oldest map I mentioned from 1590. Uh, and there's lots of things I love about these maps, but just for the sake of time, well, um, one thing I like reminding our students about is that, well, we weren't always the United States at this point in time. This was a colony of England, hence where we call get our you know, terminology for New England up in that northeast part of the country. Uh, and I've got some zoom ins uh, for you to see some of the detail and uh, to highlight this being a British colony, of course, they have to include the, the rural crest uh, and including the, the, the credit that uh, ultimately attributes this great land to Queen Elizabeth. Uh, I've got a rough translation of, of this here for you. Uh, it roughly says uh, this uh, parts of America, which is now Virginia, uh, founded by Sir Walter Raleigh in the year of our Lord 1585 in the name of Queen Elizabeth. So one more, this is our, our next oldest map. This is the 1595 map of Florida. If I hadn't have told you that was Florida, you'd probably never recognize it. <laughs> uh, the, these cartographers were quite good at what they did, but they could not figure out the marshes and swamps of Florida. <laughs> They got Cuba. Cuba's, you know, fairly accurate, I think, but uh, that Florida Peninsula they struggled with. And I have a couple more zoom ins for you to see some of the details. And they like their sea monsters. You know, we we often think about sea monsters uh, as part of the new newly undiscovered world. People didn't know what was out there, uh, and so I always have fun with those too. Next, just to illustrate some of the art we have in the archives, uh, uh, we have a lot of art from Passaquan. And if you're not familiar with Passaquan, it does require a little bit of explanation. Uh, it is actually a beautiful site here in Georgia. It's in Buena Vista, about an hour so south of Columbus. It is now owned by Columbus State University and is open to the public. Uh, and what's fascinating about it is it's really this art environment. It's seven acres worth of, you know, structures that are painted from, you know, floor to ceiling by uh, 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 Eddie Owens Martin, who called himself St. Aeum. And he was all self-taught. He had no formal training in art. So there's just two, uh, two examples of some of the sketches and, and artwork uh, to illustrate his type of artistic um, method, and, and he often painted what he called Passacoyans, which you, you can see here in these, these images. Next, just to highlight a, a, a one more example of our artwork is, uh, is some examples from John Craig. John Craig was a Columbus native who ended up serving in World War II. Uh, he served in the Pacific Theater, uh, and at heart, John Craig was a pacifist. He didn't want to go to war. He didn't want to fight. So what he did while he was overseas on this grand tour of the Pacific Theater, uh, he drew and sketched out what he saw. Uh, so the natives, local life, culture, and society, he, he documented by his artwork. So here you can see an image from a, a local person in Fiji and from the Solomon Islands. In addition to art, he was a photographer. So we have hundreds and hundreds of the photographs he took while he was overseas in, the, in that Pacific theater. So I know I went through those quickly. I, I hope maybe they, they will pique people's interest to contact us later more about our collections. Uh, but just quickly, if I still have some time, I have a few slides on our latest news projects and initiatives. Uh, so we were just successful at implementing high density movable shelving, which we're really excited and proud about. Uh, this first image is of our old static configuration, and 
Uh, you all have been in this business long enough to know the, the impact of high density movable shelving. Uh, so here's an image of, uh, of, of the new configuration. And, uh, and in fact, we more than doubled our, the capacity in our archives vault. We were roughly at about 2,500 cubic feet. Uh, and with the new high density movable shelving, that increased us with an additional you know, 2,600 cubic feet, which I've calculated at you know, a 111% increase. Uh, so we hope that we'll have decades worth of growth space to continue collecting uh, on our local area. Uh, one more, or, well, two more images of you of our new configuration. And just as Alexander pointed out on his slides, those sh shelves are empty in this picture, but they didn't stay empty for long. <laughs> They're actually all full now. <laughs> Uh, another uh, thing I'd like to highlight is a major acquisition we just went out and purchased. Uh, so uh, the Ledger Inquirer is our local newspaper. They changed ownership you know, in the mid-2000s, uh, and the new owners said, well, what are we going to do with all these, these archives? Let's sell them. And so they sold them off to, to some company. Uh, it was a real mystery to us what happened uh, at that particular time, uh, the arch archivist position here was vacant. There was nobody really to follow up on this. Uh, but just in the past couple of years, I found out where these uh, images ended up, uh, and, and I was able to go out and raise some money to buy them. Uh, so we are now quite proud that we have the, the historic photograph archives of our local newspaper, which is 80,000 physical prints from the 1920s to the 1990s. And and there's actually over 100,000 digital images to go with that. Uh, and this is actually my last slide. We realize that this is quite a massive project. So in our fundraising initiative, uh, we went out and got funding for a project archivist to manage this project. Uh, so we are actively recruiting. If you know people who are interested or in, or in the job market, they're interested in uh, a, a temporary project position, send them our way. Uh, they'll have a lot of fun with these Ledger Inquirer photo archives, uh, all 80,000 of them. <laughs> uh, and with that, I'll turn it back over to Helen. Wonderful. Thank you, David. That's amazing. I'm so glad that you were able to raise that funding. That's so cool. Uh, next up, we've got. Enough, <laughs> next up, we've um, got Jim's University Archivist and Head of Archives, Special Collections, and Digital Initiatives for Mercer University. All righty. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's it's good to meet you all. I'm going to share my screen here. Get started. All right. So yes, we are uh, Archive Special Collections and Digital Initiatives at Mercer University. We have, because Mercer has multiple campuses, we have two uh, archives in the library here in Macon, and then the library, Swilly Library in Atlanta. And there are four of us in the department. Um, our part-time archivist, Arlette Copeland, who had been here for longer than any of us, basically, maybe 22, 23 years, recently retired. So that leaves four of us. Um, myself, Catherine Sheriff, our digital archivist, Gabby Hale, processing, and Lydia, uh, archivist in digital preservation in Atlanta. So like most university archives, we have lots of manuscript collections um, because Mercer, uh, was a Baptist school. We have a lot of Baptist preacher papers, so thousands and thousands of sermons, um, professors. Uh, these are some of our most significant uh, collections, some names that you may uh, recognize. Um, Griffin Bell in particular, um, maybe. Lots and lots of manuscripts of Feral Sam's books. We love to show because the students are required to read Whisper of the River when they're entering Mercer, um, but they usually don't, even though they're required to do so. Um, we like to show them his manuscripts, their uh, composition books where he wrote, and he was a doctor, so his handwriting was not great. He wrote the books in these composition books, and there are hundreds of them, 
and the students always enjoy looking at them. We also are Mercer University's uh, archives, the records. Um, we are also the hold the records of Tift College, which was Baptist Women's College in Forsyth when um, Mercer acquired Tift in the mid 80s. We inherited their archives, so it's similar materials, you know, records, minutes, publications. And we are in the process of digitizing a lot of those. We are also the Baptist archives for the state of Georgia. So we have lots of Baptisty things, um, numerous Baptist groups. Uh, if you're familiar with church history, you know that Baptists multiply by dividing. So there are a lot of different Baptist groups with different theologies, and we have. Um, our uh, predecessors did a really good job of reaching out to some of those smaller groups and getting their records as well. So our collection is uh, very thorough. Um, other special collections, um, our oldest book collections are in the Albert Henry Newman collection. Uh, he, is a, he was a Mercer University Christianity professor who traveled and collected old books. Um, these are uh, hundreds of books in multiple languages, mostly theology, goes back as far as our oldest, um, the oldest object we have is the Incunabulum. It's a 1497 uh, Vulgate Old Testament. You can see that there in the top left picture. Uh, it's a really fun item to show people. Um, the it's got the text of the old testament in latin this is pre-reformation don't translate in anything other than latin or they will kill you um so it's latin uh, with the commentary by nicholas de lira and then whoever owned this volume wrote commentary in the margins on the commentary so it's a really nifty volume that we show students um, we also have the uh, Lynn Holmes ancient artifact collection. Lynn Holmes was a Mercer alum who went on to be an archaeologist historian. Um, he would and he collected a large amount of ancient artifacts in his travels to mostly Israel. Um, and he wanted to give those to a place uh, because Mercer was his alma mater, he gave them to Mercer with the hope that South Georgians could be able to use these, come and see these. We put them on display and we do um, every couple of years a new display and we do an event with lectures and the like. It's always, always fun to do and he's got lots of fun objects. Um, you can see there's a Roman glass bracelet for a child there with the quarter for comparison. We have some uh, a collection of Burns and Shelley works that were collected by various local people given to us. Obviously, there's the Baptists again, and we are um, the repository for Mercer University Press, so we have all of their published works. And then other fun realia objects, we have Jesse Mercer's desk, obviously, uh, Mercer University, named for Jesse Mercer, um, early 18th century Baptist pastor, leader. We have his desk there in the top left corner. And if you open that, that hatch there, there's lots of little drawers and shelves and nooks and crannies. It's pretty cool. And those are his books um, there in the shelves. We have a collection of t-shirts. The, the one there uh, at the bottom is the logo. It's a pretty fun incident in Mercer history in the 80s where Mercer got voted one of the top 10 party schools in the nation by Playboy. And some students posed off campus for Playboy and it made the Baptist mad. And so the t-shirt was made um, I don't know if you can see it. it it's it says E partibus maximus. It was they were making fun of it. It was it, it was a great incident. The students love writing papers about that, and we have the Playboy. Um, I keep it 
locked in the drawer um, so that it doesn't walk away. And we have uh, Tift College was a female college, women's college, and they did every year um, the round table where it was um, the Knights of King Arthur's Court. And we have a lot of those uh, costumes. Our Tift alumni are probably our most enthusiastic users. They're very proud of Tift. I'm very proud to have gone there not always happy with Mercer for gobbling them up. So we just don't mention the name R. Kirby Godsey when they're up here. Um, and, we, and we're moving along. Um, some of our current projects, we are um, processing our backlog of manuscript personal papers collection. When Gabby came on board in October, she's made great headway with that. Um, we're hoping to dig into here soon our university records that tend to show up unannounced from various offices. Here, we found 20 boxes. We thought we'd bring them to the archives. Great. Uh, so a little bit of notice would have been helpful on that, but okay, we'll go with it. Um, we also are, we still continue to get um, Baptist missionaries, Baptist ministers papers just in uh, the last couple of months. Um, we acquired, um, a collection of a couple who were the first Southern Baptist missionaries to Pakistan uh, in the 50s. And we assist researchers. I think our average is about 20 to 30 a month. Um, a lot of genealogists wanting to look through Baptist church records for their grandparents, great grandparents. And then Mercer University is uh, has joined a consortium for a university studying slavery. And one of our history professors has been here frequently using um, the ledgers that uh, from Penfield when Mercer was up in Greene County in the early 1830s. We're also um, beefing up URSA, our uh, digital repository. URSA stands for University Research Scholarship and archives, and of course, URSA, Bear. I wish I had come up with that. I did not, my predecessor did. It was a stroke of genius. Um, it is, so it's sort of a institutional repository. We put faculty research, student research there, as well as our digital collections. Um, during the pandemic uh, in 2020, when we were, when everything was shut down, um, Mercer's annual student research symposium had to be uh, canceled, but we were able to get a lot of the presentations online, so we still sort of were able to help them out there. Um, Catherine Sheriff, our digital archivist, um, was great in pulling that together. Um, we are still digitizing. Um, our student assistants are invaluable to that effort. Um, they stand there, flip pages on our book scanner. Um, they seem to enjoy that more than filing. So um, we let them do that. And then, like I said, Tift College is some of our most used collections. We refer people to our yearbooks and catalogs online. More recently, um, we have dived into archive space. We are in the process of getting ready to go public with it. Um, our finding aids and indexes have in the past been scattered all over our um, shared drives, multiple formats, varying levels of description, no real consistency, no real standardization um, through the years of various folks working on these. And so my predecessor, Laura Botts, was working on this. We continue trying to standardize double check our finding aids, get them into archive space um, so that they can all be in one place. And then we're hoping to go live with that um, this fall. And we're also going to link it. Um, our technical services folks are helping us link it to Alma, the library catalog, so that it'll all come up in one place. And um, we're also linking digital objects to URSA so that you can use and get, get one stop shop. So yeah, that's Archives at Mercer. Thank you very much. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen.
Thank you, Daniel. Um, and last up today, we have Renee Chirac, Curator of Historical Collections and Archives at uh, University Libraries for University of Augusta. So everybody, can everybody see my screen? Can you hear me? Okay. So um, I'm gonna be talking about two repositories, the Heritage Unit at the Augusta University Libraries. And for those of you who don't know, Augusta University was a consolidation in 2013 between uh, two legacy institutions. And there've been lots of name changes even after we consolidated, so I'm not gonna go into that, but basically the, um, The consolidation between Medical College of Georgia, which is now the health science campus of Augusta University, and Augusta State University, which is our Somerville campus. And just as we have two campuses, we have two libraries, the Greenblatt Library on the health science campus and the Reese Library on the Somerville campus. And each library has its own, um, we call it historical collections at the Greenblatt Library, special collections at Reese, to say confusion, I'm just going to refer to Reese Library and Greenblatt Library. Now, I am the curator of the historical collections and archives at Greenblatt Library, but I'm temporarily working um, two days a week in the special collections at Reese Library. So Reese Library is unique. Uh, it's kind of like Columbus State. A lot of the holdings here at Reese Library cover the history of Augusta, history of the Central Savannah River area, as well as the Somerville campus at Augusta University. Uh, there is a depository agreement with Augusta Richmond County Historical Society and Reese Library maintains almost 5,000 book titles, over 400 manuscripts, historical collection, historical photographs and vertical files with the uh, Historical Society. And the Historical Society even has an office here in the Reese Library. A part-time person works. I'm not sure she's paid or volunteer. But as I said, their uh, genealogy is also big because at one point that was one of the main collection points for the Reese Library. But I guess the Genealogical Society began around 2005. So they stopped physically collecting genealogy material here at Reese Library, but they still maintain what they had previously. And that is uh, a lot of their visitors are genealogists, people looking into their history. Uh, they also have um, students and uh, some other researchers. The historical collections and archives at Greenblatt Library, um, we only focus on the history of the health sciences in particular to Georgia and to the South and the history of the health science campus at Augusta University. Our collection consists of rare books, majority of which go back to 1834 when the first library of the Medical College of Georgia. Our oldest campus archives are the faculty minutes and trustees minutes from 1832. The majority of our manuscript collections come from formal faculty members, such as Herbie Cleckley, who wrote The Mask of Sanity, co-wrote The Three Faces of Eve, uh, Virgil Seidenstricker, who was an internationally known uh, hematologist, nutritionist, um, and also Raymond Alquist, who received the Lasker Award, his theory on alpha and beta receptors is what led to beta blockers. So, and on the record side, the record groups, campus records, uh, we do have things from all the co five colleges on this campus, um, but the majority of our institute, our campus archives are photographs and the publications, campus publications. We also have artifacts, over almost 200 medical artifacts, ranging from anatomical models, surgical instruments, microscopes, um, and the majority of those artifacts have been photographed and are available online in our institutional repository. Uh, the other difference between the Reese Library and Green Light Library is since we began, um, we've always used Past Perfect, which is more of a museum uh, 
man management system. They were on Archive Reese Library and they recently have switched over to finally Archive Space. So we do, both of us do have items available digitally. Our finding aids are you know, searchable and discoverable through our catalog and online. Uh, again, Reese Library has more visitors than I do at the Greenblatt Library. And part of uh, Reese Library right now as a unit is just me at the Greenblatt Library and Miranda at the Reese Library. She is on a leave of absence right now, so that's why I'm filling in for her. But we do not have a special collections librarian. We have a personnel shortage. And so we've kind of lost our connection with the history department and all doing classes and bringing the students in. And that's something that we do need. And both of us, as the only staff people in our departments, we don't have much time for outreach, doing much outreach things. I used to do a history of the health sciences lecture series, which of course with COVID, that hasn't started back up. Um, we also, Reese needs more space, physical space. And something important, we just uh, have a dean of libraries who just began March 1st. Before it was just a director. So now we have a dean. He's on the dean council for the university. So we're gonna have a bigger voice on a campus. We already have the library office is looking to hire a new person and their half their time will be devoted just to the libraries. So hopefully we're gonna get some more funding that, is just, that we need as a whole for the libraries. Um, and also at some point down the line, a person dedicated just to outreach and marketing for the libraries. Um, one of the also drawbacks we have is we do not have a plan for born digital items. We don't have a plan yet for that. And that's something I pointed out to the dean that we need to come up with because we are getting to the point where if anybody wants to do anything, it is digital. And we just don't have that plan put in place yet. And um, also for my, one of the reasons why I'm able to be over here at Reese for two days a week is the second floor of the Greenbelt Library is currently closed down to public. It's total renovations. It's our second phase of the renovations for the libraries. Um, we're getting new carpeting, new HVAC for the whole library, new carpeting on the second floor, new LED lighting. And my space, the historical collections completely is being expanded. The conference room next door is gonna be now part of my space. I'm also getting more additional storage space and exhibit cases for these artifacts and such. And in fact, today at five o'clock, they're shutting down the whole library electrical shutdown for one week as they switch out some things. So, yeah, so everything, I started to include some photographs of how, I mean, they've moved out everything out of the historical collections. Professional movers came in and boxed everything up carefully and moved everything out. So, yeah, so that is it. I'm glad to hear uh, addresses for our live guys on digital items and my email address. And again, I think Helen and everybody else has participated today. This has been a great day. Thank you, Renee. Um, all right, well, this will we'll enter into our Q&A portion. Uh, this is the fun social part of our program. Um, so I would encourage anybody, you don't have to, but if you wanna turn your camera on so we can put faces to names and, and get to know each other a little bit as well, uh, go ahead and do that. And I will open the floor. Anyone who would like to ask a question of one of our presenters, uh, go ahead. I will start things off actually, because I have a question for um, for Daniel. Um, we I I enjoyed the parts of your presentation where you were talking about um, the relationship with TIFT and your TIFT alums. Uh, I know a little bit about that kind of thing. We we're a consolidated university, KSU consolidated with Southern Poly in 2014. Um, and you said that your TIFT alums are really active researchers. I'm wondering um, if they're also active donors, um, if you have an active 
collecting uh, initiative with them or if there's any reluctance that you've experienced from TIFT alums about giving to what is now the Mercer University Archives? It, it does kind of depend. Um, it depends on the person, but for the most part, I mean, they have been very willing to give us things, uh, very willing to bring things. I don't get to deal with the money side of it, but um, the in terms of you know papers and books, it, it's fairly fairly steady. Um, we did a well, I should say I say we. Gabby worked on Saturday. Gabby took one for the team uh, back in March uh, when it was TIFT Alumni Day on campus and the TIFT alumni came. We had the archives open. They came. Gabby, I, I think you said you were pretty busy the whole time. I have a bit more about that. So, hi, I'm Gabby Hale, by the way. Um, so, the TIFT ladies came. We had the archives open for two hours on Saturday. And in the past, we've done this and no one's come. So, I was a bit worried, but we had probably like 20 people in and out. Um, and it's kind of like a large sorority as a university. Um, they, they get together and they all talk about, um, you know, it's a very close knit community. But while they were there, I gave out a lot of business cards, people interested in giving their, their items. So nothing has come of it yet, but they definitely do want like the history of their college preserved. Um, so the ones who do come who are very active, I think would be more willing, but I'm not sure about the people who don't, you know, come to the alumni events. I hear rumors um, of angry Tift alum who may call me one day and, uh, and that has not happened yet. It is only a rumor, and I hope that it remains a rumor. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Thank you for that. that. And so that was that uh, acquisition was in 1987. You said right. so that yeah. perhaps some time has passed, and that might be helpful to you as well. Yeah. If I can interject, I know a couple yeah. people who graduated from TIFF. That they, it was just a shock. Mm -hmm. It was like, no, uh, you know, two years, this will be happening. It was just, bam, they closed him down. And a lot of the non the ladies were just really very upset about it. And I guess still to, to, to this yeah. day. Yeah, we have a lot of the, the documents from that it's because closure they said, and merger. And, um, yeah, they said they were given their warning. If they had been, you know, let know, they would have pushed to raise money to keep the college open. But yeah. Renee, have you seen any issues uh, impacting collecting or anything like that uh, based on your institution's uh, consolidation? Um, no, no. There was a little uh, when they consolidated, not for this consolidation, but from the first name of, of the consolidation, a lot of people were not happy with that first name. So that's how we became Augusta University. Uh, but personally, no, we have not had much. Um, and again, it's because we don't have that outreach person uh, or the anybody because it's just, you know, two people basically on each place. And nor with working with philanthropy office. And now they have helped some in getting us some funds and getting some, you know, but it's usually... They contact us when an alumni says, I have some books I want to donate. And then they contact us. That's, yeah. Thanks. I only, I asked because we uh, at, at KSU having consolidated under the name KSU, um, there's, there has been some bad feeling among alums and it's been less than 10 years. Um, and I think that you know we we are really endeavoring to try to preserve the Southern Poly history, but um, yeah, I I think there there could be some slowdown in uh, alumni wanting to give things really invest uh, in this period right now, but hopefully that will not last forever. Any other questions for our presenters? Actually, have one. 
Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, I think it's Alexander. You're with Troop County. Is that correct? Um, and I can't remember the timeline, but you were talking about at one point, and correct me if I'm wrong, you all, you acquired collections from your from the local school system, the local school district. Does that include like uh, board records, like board minutes, meetings like that? And to kind of, do you know how that process kind of happened? How that, you know, how you were able to acquire them, when that was? So that was um, a little bit later, probably early 1990s that they were able to do that. Um, it, well, I'd say probably post-1993, there were actually several city school systems and they consolidated all together under the Troop County school system in 1993. And I think at that point, um, the county and city governments were already contracting with us and sending stuff to us and doing records management with us. And so I think at that point, the leadership of that, and I'm not, I was not here, so I'm not 100% uh, familiar, but I think that would have been probably, you know, conversations with the school board at that time to really, um, to get those records. And a lot of, a lot of what we've done, and I can speak to, you know, we're looking at the city of Hogansville now, trying to bring them into the fold. They feel misrepresented in our collections. Um, and obviously, you know, like their minutes, their historic minutes and stuff need to be in the collections. We always get lots of questions. You have Hogansville stuff. And so a lot of that is, you know, and as, as we all know, it's been conversations playing kind of, you know, who knows who and, and that kind of thing. We do have a board of directors uh, that's over us and, and fairly active if, you know, if we activate them, you know, we'll say, hey, can you go help us with this? And so I, I imagine that's how that happened. Um, a lady who's been on our board for a long time is a uh, Hogan's, she's on the council of the Hogan'sville city. And so that's helped us as well. Um, so, but you know, I'm not sure exactly how that would have happened. We do have board minutes. We have uh, integration records. Um, and of course, student records that are, you know, permanent. And those go back to the 19, early as the 1900, early 1900s, so. It's, a, it's interesting to me. That's what we, we preserve this for Fulton County Schools. And I, I just, I've always been looking for people who preserve public school records as an archive, you know, as a historical reference. It's really cool to know. Um, that's what makes this so great is to know you're out there and probably our stuff overlaps, but that's really cool. Thank you. Thank all of you. David, it seemed like from your presentation that Columbus State has a fair amount of artwork in your um, collections. Do those present any kind of special preservation uh, needs? Uh, how do you kind of approach that, if at all, differently from the rest of your collection? Yeah, so they do require some special needs. You're absolutely right. And uh, occasionally some of them, um, uh, we do have a couple from our RC Cola advertising art collection that are starting to crack and fall off. Uh, that has been problematic. Uh, we've got some that were not framed properly and they're on acidic matting. And, uh, the, but to answer your question, uh, we, we know better than to try and fix that ourselves. <laughs> we, we, we have uh, reached out to the Georgia Archives in Atlanta and their conservation team and um, we actually have four or five we want to actively get fixed and conserve. Uh, but the last I heard from them, they're on a travel moratorium. That, that they are not able to come down and look at them. Uh, but as soon as that travel moratorium is lifted, we want them to come down and, and, and help us address some of our issues. And the other thing that's really problematic is some of them are just really large. They don't fit in the box. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so actually what we did, I, I didn't have pictures in my presentation to share with you all, but what we did when we, we contracted out our high density shelving system with Patterson Pope, who, who we've had a wonderful time working with, by, by the way, they are a space saver vendor. Uh, they they uh, installed some of uh, the museum style art grids that you've seen that some of our really large maps and artwork can go on. Uh, and also some art bins where we can slot in some of our smaller frame stuff to uh, just to slot those in without having, you know, a lot of weight leaning up against them. And, and that really has been transformational. That, that has <laughs> done wonders for our management of our oversized art objects and maps. But they, they are difficult, you're right. <laughs> so I appreciate your question. 
Well, that's good. I'm glad you found a, a solution that's working for you with the oversized stuff. Any other questions for our presenters today? All right, well, I think that we will go ahead and wrap up. Thank you again to everybody who presented and attended today. Um, we were recording today. We will look at how to best make that recording available. Um, and stay tuned for more events coming to you from uh, the outreach and education teams. And everyone have a wonderful Friday and wonderful weekend. So take care. Thank you. Ellen, can I make a plug real quick? Yes. Summer workshop is June 23rd. It's about reparative description. So I encourage you all, all to go to um, sga.org or soga.org and sign up. It's going to be really good. Thank you, Ellen. Wonderful session. Thanks, everybody.